Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. We've been in a series about making Jesus known. This is an evangelism series and we've been trying to uncomplicate what we've complicated when it comes to evangelism. And, um, and I, I just want you to know, can I just, I'm gonna be real with you. One of the reasons why we're doing this series is because I don't want just a few of us to do this, I want all of us to do this. And the only reason why we're doing this series and it's very practical, training-like series and it's equipping people is because I've heard over and over again that people have the desire to be better at sharing their faith they just don't know how. And I, I, today is once again a practical equipping training in this room, all right? It was a little quiet last service uh, because it's like, it was like a little bit of a classroom and people were taking notes and whatnot. But if you agree with anything said, don't be afraid to say amen. Because this professor, this teacher today was wondering if we were still hearing me, okay? <laughs> um, I wouldn't waste your time if I didn't think this was important. I would not come up here and not preach these words if I didn't think is this important. And <clears throat> I want you to know that this is the most natural and effective way of evangelism that you're gonna learn today. But I will say this, in order for it to get going, it is the hardest. And so this may be the hardest uh, application to the sermon series thus far. And I think my father did a fantastic job last week preaching on Romans 10, praise the Lord. If you did not hear last week's message on how to lead someone to the Lord and pray with them, you wanna go on our YouTube channel at Calvary Dover and watch that. I think I've given enough preliminary comments and disclaimers. Let's get into scripture. Let's go to John chapter 4, 43 through 54. It'll be on the screen. And I, I really am gonna just focus in on one application of this scripture. There's so many good lessons. But in this chapter of John, John 4, we see the, the influence and the power of the gospel, Jesus Christ himself, ministering to one person, reaching one that reaches many is the title of our message today. And in John 4, Jesus reaches the woman at the well and she goes and tells the whole village of Samaria what Jesus has done. Well, it doesn't stop there. Uh, they, by the way, they begin to believe in Christ, not just on her testimony, but the words that come from Jesus' mouth. We also have a testimony because Jesus has changed our lives, <clears throat> right? And then we have the words of Christ right here. So we have what we need to do what Jesus did in Samaria with the woman at the well. We have the Spirit's help. We have the ability to have signs and wonders alongside with us. We've been given authority to minister to people through the power of the Holy Spirit, which we're talking about on Wednesday nights with our gifts class. We have all these things and Jesus wants to re reach at least one person. I wanna reach at least one person and here's why. It ends up reaching many. Reaching one reaches many. You may find that this message helps take off the burden that you need to reach the entire family Here's the thing, God wants you to re reach at least one and then the testimony of that person will begin to reach others. Let's look at John 4 and we're gonna start with verse 43. At the end of the two days, Jesus went on to Galilee. Where was he? He was in Samaria for two days, ministering to the people that the woman had brought to him at the well. Verse 44, he himself had said that a prophet is not honored in his own hometown Yet the Galileans welcomed him for they had been in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration and had seen everything he did there. <clears throat> As he traveled through Galilee, which is where he's from, he came to Cana where he had turned the water into wine. There was a government official in nearby Capernaum whose son was very sick. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went, he went and begged Jesus to come to Capernaum to heal his son who was about to die. Jesus asked, it was a pointed question, will you never believe in me unless you see miraculous signs and wonders? The official, he, he pleaded, he kind of ignores what Jesus asked and he says, Lord, please come now before my little boy dies. How many parents would probably be like that too? Good question, Jesus, but can you come right now because my boy's dying? 
So he asked that. He's bold. He's courageous about asking Jesus to heal him. Then Jesus told him, go back home. Your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said and started home. How do we know he believed? I don't know about you parents, but if, if, if I was there, I may have dragged Jesus to come with me and make him come with me. We're going to make sure my son gets healed. You're going to come with me in person. You're going to put a hand on him and you're going to heal him. No, this man left Jesus believing that his son was healed. That's faith, isn't it? Verse 51, while the man was on his way, some of his servants met him with the news that his son was alive and well. He asked them when the boy had begun to get better and they replied, yesterday afternoon at one o'clock, his fever suddenly disappeared. Then the father realized that that was the very time Jesus had told him, your son will live. And he and his entire household believed in Jesus. This was the second miraculous sign Jesus did in Galilee after coming from Judea. We see here the importance of evangelism and application for us right away and ways that we can apply this message is to imitate Christ and to go where the lost are. We can't miss this point that Jesus went to Samaria and then on his way back to Canaan or Cana, he runs into a Gentile, a, an official in Capernaum and from Capernaum. And his son was sick and they have this amazing encounter. This man demonstrates faith. He goes home and sees that his son is healed. This would not have taken place if Jesus didn't go into these places and begin to share. Now, I want you to understand something. Jesus stopped in Samaria because he was hungry, tired, and thirsty. It was there that a woman came to him at the well and he began to minister to her. And then in this situation, a man finds Jesus in need because of his son's life and Jesus responds by praying for a healing. We see here two ways that evangelism takes place. Jesus ministers in a way that he knows how, which by the way, we can both do that. If you read this story and study it, we, or we all can do this with Jesus and his help. We can minister in the same ways. Do you believe that? <clears throat> now I want you to know, we just saying there's nothing that our God can't do. There's no mountains that he can't move. One time I was singing that and I'm going to be really, I'm gonna, this is going to hurt. I, I sense that God said, um, my people are the mountain and I need them to move. We have gotten so still, so cemented in in our lives that we're not moving and we are the ones that need to move. We need to go. And that is the first application to this message is we have to actually go somewhere where we're going to encounter a woman like the woman at the well or a man who's in need and we simply minister and love them and pray for them and God begins to work. What do you know? It doesn't seem very complicated, does it? But God can do anything if we believe it and we trust him. Now, I want to get to the point of this message uh, and really the thrust for the rest of this message is that if we reach one, we reach many. And what we see here in this scripture is, and what we see in the Samaritan woman, she went back to her village and reached a bunch of people and Jesus helped her for two days. But what we see in here is Jesus did not go to this man's house, but this man was able to lead his entire family and his household to Christ. And the word in the Greek for household uh, do you remember in January, I briefly mentioned this, the word is oikos. I'm going to put a definition up. We're not talking about yogurt. <clears throat> I think that's the brand of it. I think it is. Yeah, it is. When you read the word household in the English in the New Testament, the Greek translation says oikos or oika. And particularly in the Greco-Roman culture, oikos not only described the immediate family in the house, but it also described servants their families, friends, and even business associates. So it is very well possible that Jesus helped lead an entire family to Christ by reaching one person. And that's really what happened. So guess what? Pressure off. 
hey, Ryan, how do I reach my whole neighborhood or my, my family? Just reach one. Focus on one person and let Christ do the rest through that person's life. Amen? Now, this is not an isolated event. This is throughout the New Testament, and it's even mentioned in the Old Testament, but not in the Oikos. The word Oikos is not in the Old Testament. But the same concept was there that God wanted all nations to come and worship him and he would reach them through one person. And it's the same thing in our scriptures. In Mark 2, Matthew had Jesus over, but Matthew made sure he invited his friends to join their dinner. Anyone like dinner parties? Anyone like food? I thought so. We can reach the oikos, so to say, the household by having dinner with people. Mark 5, Jesus healed a man who was demon possessed. He told him to go back to his town. He wanted to follow Jesus. He said, now nah, go back to your town and tell everyone what the Lord has done. That's his oikos. <clears throat> John 1, Peter is, is, comes to Christ through his brother Andrew. Nathaniel in John 1 comes to Christ through his friend Philip. Okay, Cornelius in John or in Acts chapter 10, his entire household believes in Christ. Acts 16, the businesswoman Lydia, she gets saved. She was, uh, she was, she dealt in purple cloths, very, very rare and expensive um, item in that town and that city. She gets saved and her entire household, it says in scripture, believed and got baptized, water baptized, which we're doing next week. We're excited for. And Acts 16, the jailer, Remember the story where Paul and Silas are in prison and the, the jail shakes and breaks them free and the jailers, he's like, I'm dead. But instead, Paul and Silas are like, no, don't, don't harm yourself, we're here. That jailer brings them to his house and Paul and Silas were able to lead that entire family to the Lord because the entire household was there. By the way, we see in, in the scripture today that Jesus used a sign and a wonder um, same thing in, in Acts 16, the miraculous escape from prison was a sign and a wonder that got the jailer's attention. You can pray for those to happen and God will move. When it's his will, when he wants to do it that way, he will do it. This is not an isolated event in John 4. It happens throughout scripture that if we reach one, we end up reaching many. Now, I wanna give you what a professor says by the name of Wynne Arn. And this is why I'm, I'm making sure we understand this today. He says this, you probably think the phenomenal growth of the early church took place because of a few dedicated apostles, those apostles being Peter, John, Paul. This is what he says. No, absolutely not. That is not why the church exploded and grew so much. It grew explosively because of the laity the people in the pew, so to say. Because ordinary men and women telling their friends and family about Jesus Christ and the good news of salvation. When it came down to it, Christian historians have found that Christianity spread when you and I shared with our family, our friends, our coworkers, our associates, what Jesus has done in our lives. That's how Christianity spread around the world. Now it did take the sacrifice of Christ to give his life for this, it did take the sacrifice of apostles to reach one that reached the many. And so it will take that for us to get these things going, to get this journey going forward. It's the most natural way for the good news of Jesus Christ to transfer. What I'm talking about today is relational evangelism in a nutshell. Let me read to you a story from the Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Carleton, Texas. Now I could say these stories here. We've, we've had people share with us how this is taking place right here in this church. I wanna give you an example outside of our church from Dr. Steve Wagner. Two members of his church, husband and wife, invited a non-Christian neighbor couple to their church's family enrichment program, kind of like Single Moms Day Out. The couple enjoyed a pleasurable and positive experience. Later, the husband and wife invited these non-Christian friends to a Sunday morning worship service, and the couple continued to attend together. Soon, the wife made a commitment to Christ through church service. 
She enrolled their four-year-old boy in the church's preschool program, which we have CCA, Calvary Christian Academy. A few months later, her husband came to Christ and they joined the church. Following their commitment, the new Christian mother encouraged a friend of hers to enroll her four-year-old in the church's school. And at the next family enrichment program, the new Christian couple brought a non-Christian friend and the wife's brother. The brother began attending a Sunday morning worship service, enrolled in a church membership class, and has since become a Christian. He, in turn, is sharing his faith with his parents. This natural web of relationships has quickly resulted in eight people making professions of faith and becoming responsible church members, and the web continues to grow. I don't know if, yeah, praise God. I don't know about you if you were lost at like halfway down that paragraph, but let me show you a chart then. Let me show you a real story. This is from a Methodist church in Bellingham, Washington. This is 19 people impacted by one man, Ron Johnson, who met Jesus Christ through someone who ministered to Ron Johnson. We don't have that web, but can you imagine that web, how far that spreads? And then how far that person's web spreads and how many people have been reached because one person reaches the many. So Ron Johnson leads his cousin to the Lord and now their marriage, this couple, now begins to invite father and stepmom, brother, sister-in-law, turns into brother, friend, neighbor, son, you get the point. All because someone was willing to go to the one person. Ron Johnson. This is a true story. This takes place in our church as well. I want to show you what works. It works, church. It works to love people, to build a relationship with them, and to share Jesus Christ. Let's do a survey real quick. All right, let's get you involved. How many of you came to Christ, all right, not to this church, but came to Christ because someone, like a family, friend, coworker, led you to Christ? or invite you to a church where you found Christ? How many of you? Raise your hand. Someone brought you to that connection, Christ or the church? Wow, it's like the majority of the room. That's awesome. So here we have an example right there where someone was invited and brought in through someone else's oikos. Why is it so positively effective? Why does it work so well? Let me give you a few things. The gospel spreads well, the oiko spreads well because of natural networks. That's a no-brainer, right? The family, the friends, the coworkers. But let me go to number two quickly. Uh, your, your oikos, your household, your sphere of influence, um, if, anyone's been, if anyone recently gave their life to Christ, hear me out real quick. Um, you have a great platform right now to share what Jesus has done. And he wants to use your testimony and your story. And when people see how you've changed because of your natural network of connections, but also because your life has changed, you, I want you to understand something. People are very receptive to your story. So even you, even us who have been seasoned Christians for a long time, People are more receptive to your story because they have a relationship with you. They have seen you lived it. That's why I'm so big on making sure you're living for Christ out loud, that you're consistent with what you say you believe, that you actually live what you believe. Amen? When they see the changed life, and some of them are, gonna, some of them are like, whoa, you see Bill? He's changed. And then some may even hold that against you because they're like, maybe it's not real, yada, yada, yada. Right, like you gotta overcome your test or like your past a little bit, that could take time. Sometimes people have held on to your past, they don't see how you really have been changed by Jesus Christ, right? So it's gonna take time. But people are receptive because they have seen the difference in you and they also know you. So your household, your oikos, your connections, your natural connections are very open to Christ right now, all of us even mine. I'm going to go down to number four. Oikos relationships support the new Christian. 
Um, one of my biggest concerns is when we evangelize but don't get people plugged in to support and care. We call that discipleship. When we minister to people through our oikos or our household, you naturally have support and nurturing already in place. As a pastor, I want you to know that this is a bigger deal than what you may think. I have seen many people walk away from God and the church because there was no one there for them in the church. Maybe some of you have been hurt in this way. Maybe some of you have heard pastors preach and Christians say, love one another, love God, let's love people no matter what, unconditionally. But when they come to church, no one talks to them. When they come to church, no one takes them out to lunch. No one helps them understand the faith. No one says anything. Whereas if we reach people through our relational connections, we are willing to already invest in those people. We're already willing to minister to them. I can't tell you how many times people have come to me and just had questions about the faith and no one has answered them yet. And they were easy questions that someone could have answered. We as a church have to work together to be a support for new believers. The reason why the Oikos effect works so well, the gospel travels so fast through people's households is because they have someone there for them to keep them strong. And so I wanna encourage us as a church to be relational and be ready to help those around us. Um, I'm gonna skip down to number seven. And my notes are online at calvarydover.org forward slash grow if you want to see these. But number seven, Oikos relationships provide new contacts. I told you this is like a training today, practical, okay? So let me give you a little research. It is said that for every new convert, new believer, they have 12 people in their Oikos or circle that is unsaved. That's a lot of people to reach, isn't it? That's the potential of another 12 salvations. Now, I'm going to be real with you real quick. Look around the pews and see how open they are. Look upstairs. I know this is my, this is my church. I help lead with the help of the Holy Spirit, with God. I take responsibility for this too. Look at the, look at the openness of the pews. Look how much room there is next to you. Now, the 9 o'clock was a little bit more open, so this is doing pretty good. One person that you reach may end up bringing 12 people in the future. Are we doing this to grow attendance? Absolutely not. We're doing this to fill heaven and crowd heaven with Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ. I want people here though that don't even know Jesus yet. And I want them to feel the love of God and see it and experience us love them. By the way, people are open to coming to church if we invite them. Statistics are crushing that myth that they won't come. They will, but they need to be invited. They're even more open to joining you in a small group and for a cup of coffee or something like that or to be at your house. So it's time to turn on our hospitality powers, our abilities and start inviting people into our lives. Let me give you scripture for that. 1 Thessalonians 2.8 has always been a, really a motivating scripture. I wanna close after this with, a, with some tough stuff I need to share with you. Um, but 1 Thessalonians 2.8, it says, we loved you so much. And by the way, when I mean tough, I mean part of the sermon. Okay, tough application. No bad news for me. All right. We loved you so much that we share with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. The reason why Paul was effective in Thessalonica, in Ephesus and Philippi, the reason why he was an effective missionary is he was relational too. Jesus was too. Jesus didn't even start his ministry until he had a team his own oikos. 
He made sure that he had people to pour into. It was the people that he called to follow him. They became Christians, but they also had Oikos as well. They had friends and family members who gave their life to Christ because he formed a team. Jesus opened his life, his, his life to include lives into his. He didn't just share the gospel, he lived the gospel in front of them. He loved them. He demonstrated what it means to follow God and to serve. Paul did the same thing. I'm gonna teach you the gospel, but I'm also gonna live among you. And he was a tent maker, so he did work on the side to not be a burden on them at that time. Not that, not that he couldn't receive offerings, he always did, but he worked as well alongside of them and he was able to show them what it means to follow Jesus. We have a few mountains to climb when it comes to sharing our lives, okay? Number one, uh, we don't have as many relationships with the lost as I think we need to have, and we need to have, period. When you've been in the church a long time, your circle of unsaved people becomes smaller and smaller, right? And hopefully for good reasons, because you keep getting people saved and, you know. So guess what you have to do? You have to now insert yourself into a area or, or a family or a person, uh, you know, a community where you're going to rub shoulders with someone who's not saved. I'm preaching to myself because pastors have to do this all the time. We're here, right? And we're helping a lot of Christians, but pastors have to intentionally make time for those who are not Christians, because we're still held accountable if we don't evangelize and share the gospel with the lost. I will have to stand before God and give a reason why I haven't told people about Jesus. Not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a believer. And I believe that the gospel still saves and is always going to save and that the word never fails and will not perish. And that eternal life exists. Those are the reasons why I still share my life and I don't just preach at people, I eat with people. I welcome people into my life. I welcome people over. I go to where they are. This is what I do. And by the way, it takes time. I have not seen a ton of fruit yet, but I'm not gonna stop. Actually, I believe there is a lot of fruit going on behind the scenes and it's getting close for some people that I'm working on, that my entire family's working on. So there are times where you have to get back into the unbelieving, unchurched culture of our world to reach them because we believe there's nothing that our God can't do because we are thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ because we all should worship King Jesus. But what I want is I want people to bow down to Jesus willingly not later on when they have to because the glory of God humbles them. I want them to bow down to him and worship him because they fall in love with him because they've been saved. We sing these songs. We know what Jesus has done for us. Now we got to do the hard part and building relationships with those around us. Here's the second mountain that we have to climb. But God is a God that can move mountains, right? Including us. <laughs> um, we got to open up our lives. We gotta intentionally create room for us to care for the lost. And I'm, I'm concerned that we are so busy with our lifestyles, our lifestyles don't allow for unbelievers or unchurched people to be a part of our lives. If you study the life of Jesus, he focused a lot of time on his disciples to train them, but he went and showed them how to minister to people outside their circle. And they made room for that. And I'm saying we gotta include the lost into our lives. We gotta make some serious sacrifices and reorient our lives to open it up for those who are lost. My wife and I, years ago, decided to not use our Friday nights to always rest, but to start ministering to people in this church and in this community and invite them over to our house. We had to reorient our idea of resting after a long week of work and begin to invest in people instead. 
There will be moments where you have to make sacrifices on a Monday, a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because God has orchestrated for the lost or the unchurched to come to your doorstep or to be next to your office desk. And he wants you to love and minister to that person. It will be inconvenient, but it's a divine inconvenience. It's a divine appointment from God. The last one, and they're all important, the last one is, is crucial. We live in a society where the relationship strength of, of families, friends, even in churches, is it's weakening. It's going to be hard to see the oikos flow so naturally for the gospel to move from person to person when in America we live individualistic society, uh, live in an individualistic society and culture where we need our space all the time and we don't fellowship with people. And meanwhile, you have the breakdown of marriages, friendships, division within different groups of people over what's going on in our world, division in churches that we're so consumed with these unreconciled differences that we don't even feel any kind of energy to be with people. Some of us are working so hard that we have no time even for our own spouses, no energy, no time for our own kids, let alone, Ryan, you're asking me to spend time with those who are unchurched and lost. I'm not. God is. It's those three mountains that we are facing. It's the fact that we're going to have to build relationships. Number two, we're going to have to make sacrifices and reorient our lives to include those who are unchurched. And by the way, they can come here. They can go to your house. They can meet you at a restaurant. They can meet you in your common interests like riding bikes or swimming, whatever it may be, the gym. And thirdly, we're going to have that mountain where it doesn't flow that easily. There's brokenness in marriages and friendships and families where only one person gets saved. But glory to God, that's one more person in heaven and one less in hell. But what happens is that one person has the courage and the belief and faith in God to go to a new person who has 12 people in their oikos to reach. Some of you may be in this room. I actually know of one story in particular. He's not here today. But his family mocks him for believing in Jesus Christ. But you know what he's doing? He's going and reaching people who will listen. Amen. 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 But someone like you went up to him and shared Jesus Christ. Simple as that. His story is someone came to him and invited him to come to church, invited him to come to Bible study, invited him to believe and trust in Jesus, to read the Bible first if you have to. Read it and come back and tell me what you think. By the way, how are we doing on the Bible distribution? A couple weeks ago? Okay, just, just so you know, a couple weeks ago, I encourage everyone to buy a New Testament Bible, an easy one to read, and hand it to people you feel led to hand it to so that it creates conversation about Jesus and scripture, all right? So I wanna encourage you to do that if you haven't done that yet. And let's see God work. Here's an example of one, just a nice thin one. An example or idea I would have is you highlight some of your favorite verses in there, give a little message here, praying for you as you read this, that you'll see Christ and that you'll see his, your need for him. If you feel comfortable, contact information as well, okay? Why don't we stand together and we're gonna pray. We're going to pray that God will move these mountains. Is, is the mountain conflict in your life? Is the mountain that you're really busy? And you got, you got, to, you got to trim some things out of your life. Is the mountain that you've been hurt relationally and you just don't have anything left in you to pour out? That's, that's very real. Is the mountain that you're lacking that burden, which is our first message of the series, that, that burden for the lost, or is the mountain that the people you're ministering to is just, they're not, they're not hearing it, they're not receiving it. God moves mountains. 
My heart is that God takes care of our needs so we can help others. I believe that. I've seen him do that. And God's going to ask you to move some things, to make room in your life. Uh, I, I want to, I just want to let you know, God really, really cares about you. And he really cares about the church. But if you read the life of Jesus, he constantly left the 99 to go after the one. And it's no offense to you or me, but I think sometimes that Jesus wouldn't be in the church building all the time. He would be out there. He went to the synagogue all the time, but he didn't stay there. He was active. And that same Jesus, his spirit lives in us through the Holy Spirit. And I'm believing that if you're willing to let him move you into work, just one thing at a time, he will do it. Amen. Real quick, one more time. Look at the emptiness of the pews. They represent, that emptiness represents empty lives that need Christ. Christ wants to fill them. He wants to fill souls with him. Let's pray that God will fill this place because we go out and share Jesus and invite just one. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this word today. God, I feel you and I sense you just pleading through this message, Lord. I feel your spirit pleading to us to care about this, to believe you and trust you that you will work in one life and reach many. God, I pray that we would be willing to move and we would be willing to make room, God, and you would help us to overcome those things that have hurt us with other people or maybe the, the barriers that we're gonna face the mountains we're going to face with the people we're ministering to. God, we pray for our breakthrough. God, we pray for the gospel to advance. And Lord, we pray that you would pull us, Lord, out of our, our stillness, Lord, of, of not doing these things, God. Move us, Lord, and let it be genuine. Lord, may we be real with you that we need your help. God, we thank you that your gospel is power to save, that it saved our lives. And Lord, we are motivated by this message to go out and reach one, Lord, just reach one. So Lord, give us your wisdom, give us your spirit, give us your love to do that, Lord. We remember today that someone reached us, someone loved us enough to point us to Jesus, and we're grateful for that person. We're grateful for this church, Lord, that it's a safe place to bring the lost. It's a safe place to grow. Lord, I pray that you would send us out with a new fa uh, passion and fire, Lord, to reach those around us. Help us to do the hard things, moving those mountains in our lives and building relationships and not just saying the gospel, but sharing the gospel with our lives. We thank you, Lord, for everything you're doing in this church. We thank you for the testimonies of evangelism and salvation and the works increase it all the more. And God, fill these pews with those who are not saved or those who are newly saved, whatever you want. Those who, are, who have been um, left out at churches or don't have a fellowship, whoever we reach, God, they're all invited. Lord, I pray that we would be a church that invites and invests for one. And we trust you with the many. And we trust you with our needs as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>